Good evening. Welcome back to another Gotham Center event. My name is Peter Christian Eigner. I am the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you all again to another event. If this is your first time with us, I invite you to learn more about us online at gothamcenter.org, where you can find digital exhibits, dozens of podcasts, hundreds of recorded interviews and panel discussions, and nearly 1,000 articles, book reviews, and more on all things New York City history. Those of you looking for a deeper dive may also be interested in our new online education program, Gotham Ed. You can find uh, past and future courses at gothamed.com. Tonight, as part of our regular series of free book talks featuring the, the best and most interesting new work on New York City history, we'll be discussing Benjamin L. Karp's new book, The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution. Like so much else uh, from this period of the city's history, the Great Fire has been mostly forgotten, even though it was the first major conflagration in New York's history and probably the worst after the fire of 1835, also known as the Great Fire. Hard measurements of the damage are difficult to tally, but anywhere from an eighth to a quarter of the city burned from the dock ward near Whitehall across the South Ward in Lower Manhattan and up the West Ward along the Hudson to King's College where it stopped a few blocks from today's City Hall Park. Before the age of coal, people lived in a world of wood and the Great Fire might just be seen as a particularly awful example of this ever looming threat. Until now, that is largely how scholars have viewed it as an accident for a long time, not even included as part of the history in America's war for independence. Debate raged over its origins at first, but the evidence was inconclusive. And many of New York's founding generation came to see the fire as a gift even clearing the land for the massive development that kicked off in the early days of industrialization. But the story of the Great Fire cannot be divorced from New York's role as the center of military strategy for both, for both sides at the start of the American Revolution and the battle for control of the city, which raged across the summer and fall of 1776, the largest and really the most important confrontation of the war determining whether the colonial rebellion would survive. I don't wanna give any more of the mystery away, so I will stop here and hand things over to our expert. But allow me first to briefly introduce him and our discussant this evening. Benjamin L. Karp is the author of two other books, Defiance of the Patriots, The Boston Tea Party and the Making of America, which won the Triennial Society of the Cincinnati Cox Book Prize in 2013, and Rebels Rising, Cities and the American Revolution, published in 2007. With Richard Brown, he also co-edited the third edition of Major Problems in the Era of the American Revolution, a popular docu documentary textbook. And he has published numerous articles in Early American Studies, the William and Mary Quarterly, and other professional journals. His research has been supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation and other prestigious fellowships. Prior to joining uh, Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center, he taught at the University of Edinburgh and Tufts University. He's also written articles for Colonial Williamsburg, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Russell Shorto is the author of five books, including Revolution Song, A Story of American Freedom, and of course, The Island at the Center of the World, an international bestseller which has been translated into 14 languages and won numerous awards. In 2009, he was given a knighthood by the Dutch government for advancing Dutch American historical awareness. In 2018, he was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame. He's a senior scholar at the New Netherland Institute, a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine, and now executive director of the Institute for New York City History, Politics, and Community at New York Historical Society. I'm gonna turn things now over to Russell, but first the usual bit of housekeeping. As always, uh, presentation and discussion will last until about 7.30 or so, at which point we'll take your questions. We have disabled the chat function out of respect to our speakers, but I encourage you to send in questions at any time during the next hour using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So with that said, please join me in welcoming our guests with a bit of silent applause. Thank you very much, Peter. There he is. Uh, ben, nice to see you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having us. Ben, it's great to be on this program with you. Uh, it's uh, uh, reading your book, uh, which I've done twice now, uh, was really enjoyable. Uh, congratulations, you got, you're getting some nice attention for it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a little overwhelming, um, but but yeah, a lot of fun. 
That's good. Uh, you know, one uh, in particular, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, Washington Post ran a really nice piece on it. Uh, Robert Kaiser, former managing editor, uh, and just to quote from him about your book, he said it gives the reader a chance to watch a talented historian build a powerful case for a bold interpretation of an important event that other historians have interpreted differently. I mean, I think that's what you want, right? If you're yeah. a writer of history, that you want that sentence. Yeah, I mean, he he was already interested in the topic, and I'm glad he thought I did a good job. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, uh, I know that you've been fascinated by this fire in New York in 1776, which history, as Peter said, has uh, largely let slip by. I've n I know you've been fascinated by it for a long time. Why is that? Take us back. How does it fit into your historical imagination? Yeah, this is ancient Benjamin Carp history because I've been fascinated by this fire since I was an undergraduate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I started looking into the revolutionary period. I was interested in a bunch of things having to do with fire, fire as protest, firefighters in the American Revolution, uh, fire as symbolism, actual fires. Uh, and, um, and yeah, they, uh, I, I spent some time actually doing some research at the New York City Fire Museum and the New York Historical Society uh, in, a, in the summer in between my junior and senior year. And that was when I first started reading some of the primary sources and secondary sources having to do with the fire and really getting intrigued both uh, especially by the disconnect between what I was seeing in the primary sources by eyewitnesses who had been on the ground and saw the fire, and if they were British or loyalist, were abs and in some cases, if, if they were rebels, were absolutely convinced that the fire had been set deliberately. And then you read the secondary sources, you know, especially early histories of New York or early histories of New York firefighting, and that you know, and they they want nothing to do with that theory. Um, and so it was trying to uh, uh, tease out that mystery that really got me interested in it. And, um, you know, I've worked on these other projects over the years, but whenever I would come across a collection that like overlapped with the fall of 1776, I would be like, hmm, I wonder if they had anything to say about the fire. So I've been trying to, cumu trying to accumulate additional evidence. And finally, I was like, you know what? I need to get this book out of my system uh, and, and put up the bat signal and see if anyone else, you know, has gotten intrigued by this and wants to use my book as a starting point. And then they find some of their own stuff. That's not going to happen until somebody writes at least one book about the about the fire. Yeah, so it's the first book about it, right? Yeah, I mean, there have been chapters, right? You know, uh, uh, Barnett Schechter, his battle for New York has yeah. a, a, a good chapter about the fire. It's been definitely mentioned here and there, but nothing like a full length treatment. Right. So now just to back up for a second, are you saying that you were just fascinated by fires in general? I mean, like as a kid, did you like run down the street to the fire? No, I was not that type of kid at okay, all. Okay. I just I, I got interested in it as a as, as a historical topic, as you, you know, this this idea of um, I'm quoting uh, some historians who wrote about the 19th century, the idea of fire as a as a good servant and a bad master. Um, and it's it, its role in human history is just uh, interesting to me. And Eventually, my interest in urban fires became an interest in urban politics in general in the 18th century. And so that's how I got interested in looking at things, you know, like uh, revolutionary protests before uh, the war began and in the Boston Tea Party specifically. And I guess I've, I guess I've hit upon this theme of uh, people behaving badly in the service of revolution. Um, and uh, and so I guess I I had more thinking to do before I could write about this fire in a in a mature and interesting way. I don't think I've heard that quote before about good servant and bad master, but it's I mean you, all of human history except for the past hundred or so years, fire was all important, and uh, it's such an easy thing to to forget about, even if you're doing history or if you're if you're you know living in in those days. Yeah, I, I mean, especially yeah, I mean, having to do with um, with wood, with coal. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's really everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So you begin the book with the sentence: "New York is a city that never learns its lessons." I think I agree with you, but what do you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, some uh, that statement has a little bit to do with just basic uh, fire prevention. Where I guess New York City did eventually learn its lessons by switching to thing, you know, building materials like steel and concrete. Uh, that does help to prevent uh, to prevent fires. But one of the interesting mini stories within the book is that in the 1760s, uh, the the Common Council tried to pass a law saying, "Hey, no more building with wood." 
for our, you know, for our shingles on the roofs or, uh, you know, or building our houses out of wood. We're, we're going to, we're going to turn this city into a fire trap. All it's going to take is one bolt of lightning or an unswept chimney. And this whole place is going to go down. They say from now on new construction, use, use masonry, use brick, use stone, use things that aren't going to burn. We'll be like a, a, a mature Western European city, not, you know, not a pile of sticks. Uh, and the carpenters protest so vociferously that the common council is like, okay, okay, we'll postpone it a few years. And they keep postponing it and they keep postponing it. And New Yorkers keep petitioning about it. Uh, and it's not, it, it's still not set to take effect. And then the war comes. And of course, what happens, you, you know, within a few short months of armies occupying the city, um, a, a fifth of the city burns down. Uh, and so people had been warning New Yorkers, you know, use a different building material. Uh, but New Yorkers' uh, refusal to e even like mutually agree to some building codes uh, is what leads to this um, to this tragedy. Yeah, let's uh, let's orient people. Um, where are we in the war? We're at the early stages of the war. Yeah, yeah. In, so 1776, we, we we often think of the history of New York City of, oh, the, the British occupied New York City from September 1776 all the way to evacuation day uh, on November 25th, 1783. And we think of it as a British occupied city. Uh, but for several months from, uh, well, in terms of Washington uh, being in the city, from about mid-April until mid-September of 1776, it was an American occupied city. Uh, there were still British warships in the harbor, uh, but it was American troops uh, from really for much of 1775 and early 1776 who really controlled the town. Uh, and uh, and as the British army got closer, more and more civilians fled. And so for much of 1776, New York City is a is a city at war. And both sides really agreed that New York City was the strategic center, right? Boston or Philadelphia might think that they were at the center of everyone's attention in 1776. Uh, I don't really think that's true. Sure, they signed a document that we, you know, later decided was important uh, on on July fourth of seventeen seventy six. Uh, but uh, but in New York, right, that's where the armies are. Right, the British uh, ha have shown up in force uh, in New York Harbor uh, from June seventeen seventy six onward uh, with the largest uh, amphibious expeditionary force uh, in centuries. And uh, and the American army uh, has has just about the same number of men, but trying you know, but spread out throughout New Jersey and Long Island and um, and the archipelago and uh, and southern Westchester County, what's now the Bronx, uh, you know, trying to make a stand and seeing whether they can prevent the British from occupying New York City the way they had been occupying Boston uh, over the winter of 1775. And what was the, um, the, the, why was it strategically important? Why did both sides feel that it was so vital? And New York City gives you access to Long Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey, of course. Uh, and then it's also there at the mouth of the Hudson River, uh, which gives you access to Albany in the interior and then up the Mohawk River to the west. Uh, and then with some portages and stuff, eventually access to Lake Champlain and, and Canada. And so in the minds of people who knew how to read a map, uh, New York City really seems like, as John Adams says, a kind of key to the whole continent. Uh, th this fantasy that if New England was a uniquely rebellious part of the 13 colonies uh, and elsewhere people were a little bit more mixed in their opinion, if you could use New York City and the Hudson Champlain Corridor to cut New England off from the remainder of the colonies, uh, that this might be a really winning strategy for the British. And from the American perspective, that's something that they very much uh, wanted to prevent. Uh, the more uh, cities are in their power, uh, as opposed to in the power of the British, uh, the more places they will be able to uh, do business and, and, um, and engender the loyalty of people in North America. You know, you're focused on fire, but water is another vital element here because um, in order to get around, you didn't, and especially if you want access to the interior um you need rivers and the hudson uh with new york with manhattan island down at the at the base in the harbor um that that's vital that's what the the british wanted to get and what washington desperately wanted to stop them from getting yeah yeah and you can see them then pursue the strategy the following year of okay we'll have burgoyne march down from quebec and we'll try and uh control the entire 
uh, Hudson Champlain Carter. And you can see it in Washington's fantasies all the way up until the eve of Yorktown, where he's like, gosh, I'm desperate to get uh, 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 to get New York City back. Uh, and he keeps having to be <laughs> talked out of trying to um, uh, to reinvade the island. So we're early in the war. Both sides really feel that this is vital. Uh, at, at this time, Washington and his army are in New York, and they're trying to defend it. And New York historically is a very difficult place to defend. Yeah, particularly if you don't have naval support. Uh, it, it is very difficult. I mean, Manhattan is a, a, a huge island, uh, very difficult to defend every possible place where an army might land. Uh, you know, particularly if that army has secured Long Island and Staten Island, uh, right? That does not leave you with a lot of room to man to maneuver. W Washington is eventually able to hold up, pull up among the heights uh, in Upper Manhattan for a little while, uh, but within a couple of months, uh, the British Army will eventually have dislodged him from there as well. And it's a strange thing, people. You know, Lexington and Concord to Yorktown. People have these. Uh... Uh, the iconic battles of the American Revolution and somehow the battle for New, New York, as our mutual friend uh, uh, Barney Schechter titled his book, uh, that itself, you're talking about the fire being uh, kind of forgotten. The battle for New York is a little bit uh, gets short shrift as well. Yeah, well, I mean, in part, that's because the Americans lose all of the battles. I mean, the fall <laughs> of 1776 is often referred to as the kind of lowest point of the war or the darkest days of the war from the American perspective. And until um, George Washington wins these kind of morale boosting victories at Trenton and Princeton, uh, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the success rate of the Continental Army from about midsummer until the end of 1776 is, is quite dismal. So take us quickly through the the battle for New York up to the the fire. Sure. Uh, I mean, the the the, the British take uh, Staten Island uh, pretty early on uh, in uh, uh, in June. I forget the exact date. And so they're, they 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 begin you know using that as a place to get water and you know rest and uh, and uh, uh, for for much of the summer. Uh, and then it takes a while. They're waiting for other ships to come in, including their 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 Hessian uh, mer mercenaries. Uh, and then on August 22nd, they begin landing on Long Island. August 29th is the battle for Long Island, which they, they succeed. And uh, Washington is able to get most of his army uh, to Manhattan. But at that point, he realizes that his situation is really quite untenable. And by uh, early to mid-September, he says, all right, we got to start moving stores. And sure enough, the British invade Kipps Bay, excuse me, on September 15th. Uh, they uh, they take all day, but they eventually get their army to the west side of Manhattan. Uh, they they occupy the city, which is only Lower Manhattan at that point. Uh, and Washington and his army are up in Washington Heights uh, and, and Inwood and Kingsbridge. Uh, but otherwise, the British control the lower part of Manhattan at that point. Uh, and then the fire takes place six days after September fifteenth and the and, and the Battle of Kipps Bay, when the British uh, begin their control of Lower Manhattan. You have a chapter devoted to Washington's bad options. What are his bad options? Yeah, well, starting in August, starting in late August, when it's clear that the British are going to be able to command Western Long Island with ease uh, and draw, and eventually be able to draw on loyalist support there, Washington basically has three choices. He can try and defend Manhattan, right, at the, uh, and risk whatever portion of his army he puts, he, he's going to try and put up against the concentrated might of the British Army and Navy. Uh, so that's one option is to defend. Another option would be to just flee, right, and uh, and and leave the the bounties of New York City for the British. They would get a headquarters, they would get a naval base, they would get a marketplace for loyalists to flock to and begin to resume trade. Uh, they 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 would have a, a beacon of loyalty to King George the uh, Third that would be able to be be able to begin trading with New Jersey and Connecticut and the Hudson Valley and and all these other places. So a sort of middle option might have been, well, if we're not going to stand and defend, maybe we could still abandon New York, but not leave it as a prize for the British. We could just burn it behind us. Uh, that is a tactic that has been followed by armies in the past. Uh, we basically, they basically do that in Brooklyn. Uh, they, they burn a bunch of hay fields and stuff in order to deprive these um, stores to the British. Uh, they could do that to New York City too. 
It's not a step that they're going to take lightly because New York City, even though it only has a population of 25,000 people, that makes it the second largest city in the 13 rebelling colonies. Uh, and you never know what's going to happen with a fire. Obviously, any fire will indiscriminately destroy the homes of people who were both loyal to the king and who were rebellious. Uh, you know, so it's a big step. And Washington doesn't want to just do it on his own. Uh, and so he begins kind of talking with various civilian authorities being like, hmm, is this something we want to do? Can we field out this question? Uh, it's some, it, 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 it seems like something he talks to his top generals about, uh, but he definitely is talking with his war council about when he should evacuate because um, it seems clear to him that, that New York City is going to be untenable. What are your feelings about Washington as a military commander in general over the whole course of the war? I mean, there's, you know, of course, he's valorized, but yes. uh, there's also a long tradition of people thinking he was a pretty lousy uh, military yeah. leader. The, the, yeah, the, the cynical view that he that he won the war without really winning a lot of major battles. Yeah. Right. Uh, or, or to the extent that he did so, it was with uh, significant French help. Uh, but, I, you know, but there's another way in which you could say, well, that that is his genius. I mean, you you, you look through his correspondence, uh, his respect for civilian authority, his willingness to give up power after the war is over, uh, his um, his ability to kind of be simultaneously a, a, a politician and general and and manage this unruly coalition and uh, and some of the limitations he faces as far as money, and still be able to kind of have an awareness that as long as his army is still standing, that that represents a, a beacon of hope for this rebellion, that all he has to do is, is hold out until the British are too exhausted to, to, to continue to pursue this. Uh, his recognition of that as a political strategy uh, is what it takes to be a successful rebellious, uh, rebellious general, I think. Um, and so in that respect, uh, he may not have been a, a, a supreme tactical genius, but he certainly understands what it takes to be a general, which is a strategic and and political position, not merely a tactical one. Right. Um, you're one of the great things about your book for some, for somebody who writes history is that you dive into sources. You go to sources that people have neglected or overlooked, um, and uh, you form uh, you form a. a I guess a counter thesis. I mean, it, I, it seems to me that the I should put this in the form of a question: Is the prevailing thesis about the fire of 1776 that we don't know who started it? Well, or that it may have just been a complete accident. Uh, yeah. the, you know, the basic idea is: Hey, uh, uh, you know, this isn't really that historically interesting an event, either because it was an accident, and accidents happen all the time, and that we don't necessarily think of them as as being particularly historically significant. Or if we think it was started by someone, uh, it was by random miscreants who had no particular uh, reason for doing so, other than the fact that they were just being drunk or mischievous. Uh, and therefore, there's no connection to anyone with a serious commitment to the American rebellion. Uh, and therefore, we can just dismiss the fire and uh, and think about more glorious aspects of the American Revolution. Uh, when, when I talk to military historians, I say, well, this is military history, but of the scuzziest kind, uh, because uh, because this is the aspect of war that uh, that isn't covered in glory and that we prefer not to think about. Uh, OK, so you make. Uh, you come down firmly on the side of it uh, being deliberately started and by the Americans, by the by, by people with American sympathies, uh, right. it, whether Washington gave explicit orders that were followed by his men and that that was the reason for the fire or whether it was by a group of people acting on their own. That is harder to determine from the sources, but it does seem clear that the fire to me that the fire was started deliberately and that the people who would have started such a fire deliberately would have had sympathy for the American cause. OK, so going back to uh, Washington, though, um, fi I mean, fire, talk about fire as a as a weapon, so to speak, on both sides. Yeah, bo I mean, so bo both sides had used fire as a weapon. I mean, New Englanders in particular were outraged with the British. And of course, in the Declaration of Independence, you know, one of the things they accuse King George III of having done is he has burnt our towns, uh, you know, because uh, Charlestown, Massachusetts, during the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17th, 1775, uh, Falmouth up in Maine, which is now part of Portland, uh, Jamestown, Rhode Island, you know, so within sight of Boston and Newport, the two largest cities in New England, the British were burning towns. Uh, you know, and then and then this place in Maine as well. 
Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, which is the sixth largest town in the 13 colonies, also uh, is burned on New Year's Day and afterwards of 1776. The British started the first fires by cannonading the town, but then Virginia and North Carolina militiamen affiliated with the rebellion come in and end up burning like something like 85% of the city. But the Americans somehow turn this story around and say, well, the British burned that place too. Uh, so by the time we get to the the fire, uh, the, the great fire of New York City, both sides had participated in destroying major places uh, in the American landscape. And uh, and the truth is, uh, either side could have come close to being responsible for the burning of Boston too, uh, during the, the, the evacuation of the British in March of 76. And it's, I mean, you, you talk a lot about the, uh, the less than valorous nature of war and this war in particular. And yeah. it's entirely possible to for your side to start the fire and then later propaganda blame the other side for doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I only talked, by the way, about the fires that precede the, the Great Fire of New York City. There are dozens more uh, throughout the war. And when you talk about uh, the, the uh, Washington and his men, their campaigns against Native American settlements, uh, the numbers go up even more. Sure. Oh, yeah, right. He was town destroyer, right? That yeah, was it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Concatorius. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so his, he, he felt constrained by uh, politicians in terms of doing things like this, right? Yes. I mean, obviously, right, what the what the, what American politicians want, what the Continental Congress wants is to defend as much of the uh, of the American colonies as they can from the British. And obviously, they would like those towns to uh, to be <laughs> to be intact. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, they, and, and they really do get really outraged whenever the British destroy a town. And they even start entertaining fantasies later in the war, like, oh, we'll start sending ships over to the British Isles and burn some of their towns in revenge and things like that. Uh, but I may have forgotten part of your question. I'm sorry. No, no, that was, uh, well, it was about Washington feeling that he was constrained by oh. what the... Uh... The politicians, right. so, the politicians in Washington. Yeah, so this is the thing, right? Like Washington cares about his own reputation. He does not want to be seen as the head of an unruly army that just gets out of control and begins burning everything in sight. He recognizes that he owes something to Congress and to the people that they represent. And so he really does not want to develop a reputation as the head of a destroying army. In fact, after New York, He's really reluctant to occupy cities with his army, which is why all the famous winter encampments are in places like Valley Forge and Morristown and Newburgh, right? He wants to keep his army away from cities uh, for the most part because he doesn't want his men, uh, you know, running amok in the sight of a, lar of a lot of civilians. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Washington's respect for civilian authority is well known. Uh, and, um, you know, and... and I think he would have been very reluctant to take responsibility on his own for burning New York City. I don't think he wanted to take that kind of responsibility on his shoulders. And you can see that when he writes to the Continental Congress and says, hey, uh, I'm going to probably have to evacuate this place. Should I leave it intact for the British's winter quarters or should we, you know, should we get out of here and then burn the place behind us? Which Americans had been, it was rumored that the Americans were going to do this all throughout the summer. Uh, the British keep hearing rumors that as soon as the Americans evacuate New York City, they're going to burn the place behind him. I'm sorry, I had to mute myself because my dog is barking in the background. Um, uh, so let's follow the scenario that uh, he ordered it. Can you so play that? If he ordered it, or if he said something like, will no one rid me of this meddlesome city? Um, right. If he ordered it, then what it seems like he did is he had one of his colonels in Paulus Hook, New Jersey from Connecticut, send uh, either one boat with eight men on it, or maybe a few boats with 40 seamen on it to land, to row across the Hudson, land behind uh, Trinity Church and St. Paul's and set fires there. It also seems as if uh, he would have instructed either men who were imprisoned by the British at the Battle of Long Island and then um, released on parole or men who were just left behind in the city in secret after the Americans evacuated and left them with explicit instructions to burn the city, possibly in coordination with civilians who were still in the town. So if Washington ordered it, that's the way he did it. And the British do find evidence of this. They capture 
officers with their officers' commissions on them. They uh, they seize soldiers and throw them into burning buildings. Uh, and it and it appears to be the case that some of these people were officers and soldiers in the Continental Army and its attendant militia units. So if he did this, this was all. I mean, there was nothing in writing, right? There was no. Uh... No, I mean, you know, it's like if you've ever, if you're a fan of the HBO show The Wire, right? You don't take notes on a criminal conspiracy, right? right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, it, 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 Congress explicitly wrote to to Washington and said, "No, please don't burn New York, or you know, make sure that it's not burned by one of your soldiers." Uh, you know, and and but Washington had previously said, like, if you order me to burn it, make sure you keep it a secret <laughs> because it'll change <laughs> the British Army's plans if they know we're about to burn the place. So that 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 hint. Right, like, hey, if you decide to burn this place, keep it a secret. Might suggest, and you don't want to argue from a lack of evidence, mm -hmm. right? But it might suggest that if Congress had also written Washington another letter saying, "Yeah, burn that place down," uh, that that letter probably would not survive for historians to look at, uh, right. because it would have been destroyed. You know, it would not have been preserved in documents because it would have been something that made the American Army and and Congress itself uh, look kind of bad. Okay, so just to uh, clarify, we're talking about the burning of New York. What was New York geographically? It's just the southern tip of Manhattan Island, basically. Yeah, it doesn't exist much above what's now Delancey Street or even Canal Street. Uh, where you know the con the concentrated, dense urban part of the city is all Lower Manhattan. The rest of Manhattan was inhabited, but much less densely. Uh, it was either farms or uh, or still wooded areas, the way uh, Inwood Hill Park is today. Okay, so give us the oh, there we go. Um, uh, so, okay, so there's a, a, a good map for those who know Lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, will this, this isn't the map that you have in the book that shows- No, I don't use this one because this one's a little bit more commonly known. There's a version of it actually at the New York Public Library. Uh, the Ratzer Plan has, has, has a number of imprints, but there are a couple of them uh, that show the burned part of the city. Uh, I believe British engineers or officers uh, later showed on maps, uh, you know, on existing maps that they had, here's the portion of the city that burned, uh, because it remained uh, a, a sort of wasteland throughout the British occupation. And so the British uh, wanted people who looked at the maps to kind of say, well, yes, this is New York City, but there's a portion of it that's basically unusable to us because it's um, it's a ruin of, uh, of brick skeletal structures uh, and ash. Um, and how do we know the locations of these ignition points? Those come from testimony of people who were eyewitnesses. I was standing on the corner of X and X and I saw this person carrying a torch or we discovered a cache of combustible materials uh, in this house on Chatham Row, uh, which, which is now Park Row uh, by City Hall Park. Uh, so th those come from eye eyewitness accounts, either contemporary accounts that appeared in newspapers or by letter writers immediately after the fire in 1776, uh, or from testimony that was given in an inquest that was done by the British, which we haven't talked about yet, but it was a major source for my research. Uh, and that was done basically a month before the British evacuation in October of 1783. Uh, and the, the, the ignition points are mostly on the west side, and what burned was mostly the west side, I think. Yes. So was there a, a, a logic to that if you're patriots setting these fires? Actually, it's the opposite of good logic in a way. I mean, the more commercial, the, the part that's more useful for commerce and the Navy are really the East River docks. You can kind of tell from this map that the East River is uh, much better for, developed for commerce at this time. All the, the Hudson River has is really just a couple of docks and ferries, a couple of wharves and ferries. Um, the area that was burned, one thing that you could say about it is that a lot of that land was owned by Trinity Church. And so if you think of the American army as being dominated by Protestant dissenters, particularly Congregationalists and Presbyterians, who often didn't have a lot of love for the Church of England or the Anglican Church or the Episcopalian Church, the idea that they burned houses on Anglican lands might be significant. But the truth is, in terms of significant buildings that burn, it's the Customs House, the Lutheran Church, which was also Loyalist, and the First Trinity Church on the corner of Wall Street and, uh, and Broadway. Uh, and then uh, and then some mansions of wealthy people along Broadway. But then a lot of that area west of Broadway that's burned uh, were really working class homes that were constructed by the tenants who had 99 year leases from uh, from Trinity Church. Uh, and so the part that burned 
was not didn't really seem to have a ton of uh, of military value. On the other hand, right, it, that might just have been an accident of the wind. The wind was blowing in that direction. Uh, and what they tried to burn was the more uh, commercially significant part of the city. Uh, but because of the wind, the fire hugged closer to the Hudson River. And that's what's destroyed. So there is some intentionality behind burning New York City. But if you're really trying to burn several blocks of a city, there's only so much you can do without the help of um, of a good strong wind. Right. But it seems like most of these ignition points are on the west side. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, although there seem to be a couple that are that are in areas that are not shaded, right, that are not shaded yeah. as the burn zone. Um, uh, you know, it is true that they caught people in the act in the area that was heavily burning. Uh, but there were some other places, too, where they discovered caches of gunpowder that they saw as suspicious or, you know, or caught people trying to uh, to get off the island uh, in other parts of the city. OK, so what are the results of the fire? What's the impact? Uh, how much was the property damage? How many people died? Yeah, the geographer that I worked with, the uh, uh, geographer that I worked with on these on this map, uh, William Keegan and I calculated and it's really hard to come up with the numerator and the denominator for this but we we calculated that it's about 20 percent of the urbanized part of the city so a fifth of new york city if you think of it as maybe having 4200 buildings uh it looks like something like 800 to, to 900 buildings then burned uh as a result of this fire uh as far as people killed it was usually pretty easy to outrun an 18th century fire and so as far as i know no one is killed because they are like kind of you know trapped in an attic or something and and died as an accident it's not very well documented but the british do kill a few people on the spot because they catch them doing something suspicious and believe that they are in the act of setting a fire uh and the laws of war at the time basically stated if you catch an incendiary in the act you can summarily execute him and so the british do that they stab at least one person to death with bayonets they throw people into burning buildings it's not clear how many people die this way, uh, but you know. But if we want to think of the uh, of the Great Fire of New York as an American act and something that makes the Americans not look so good, the fact that the British uh, commit some of these summary executions also doesn't make them look that great either. Uh, and so I think both sides ended up having an interest in sort of burying this story. And um, if Washington did not directly order it, what's the argument for? Uh what happened who who were these patriots taking it entirely on their own uh, uh device or getting loose uh instructions or you know how is that how is the word spreading the argument there is that it was either a couple of um really gung-ho officers who took it upon themselves because they did not necessarily see the lines of authority for coming from general washington as all that strong that this included some rank and file soldiers um, who had a reputation for uh, being really, really disobedient, almost to the point of mutiny uh, during the summer of 1776, uh, and maybe some radical civilians who also remained in town uh, for the purposes of making life hell for the British. Uh, that it was a coalition of civilians and uh, and soldiers and officers who just decided to take this upon themselves. Uh, and do what Washington might have been too reluctant to do and say, let's take the really radical step. What could make us better Republicans, right? Using the small r uh, definition of the term Republican. What could make get, uh, what could be a greater sign of Republican virtue than destroying our own private property or our fellow citizens' own private property for the sake of the public good, right? Which is to uh, disrupt the British ad ad advance, right? This would be a, a, a supreme and radical act of patriotism to uh, to further the common cause by sacrificing an American city. And you you don't have evidence that that Washington gave uh, such an order, but on what evidence do you base your argument that it was indeed the American patriots? Uh, well, I, I mean, so what, Washington doesn't give the order, but he does say after the fire, um, I think that Congress forbidding me from burning the city was a mistake. And by the way, providence, by which he means God, God or some good honest fellow has done what we didn't see fit to do for ourselves. And then he turns around and he vouches for three different American captains who were accused by the British of having played a role in burning New York City. One of them dies in prison in 1777, a man named Amos Fellows from Connecticut, who was uh, caught by the British and accused of having set the fire, and then he languishes in a British prison. 
Another guy, Abraham Van Dyke, who was from New York and the captain of the Grenadiers and a, a, the owner of a tavern keeper on the corner of John Street and Broadway, he stays in the British prison for 18 months and they accuse him of having burned the city. And Washington later writes a letter of recommendation on his behalf. Hey, he's a good guy. He did a lot of services for the cause and he suffered. Uh, and then also uh, a guy named Abraham Patton, who is definitely a spy for the Americans. He's caught trying to burn New Brunswick, New Jersey in June of 1777, maybe to coincide with the King's birthday and have a fireworks show by burning British occupied New Brunswick. Uh, and he's caught and on the gallows, supposedly, he says, oh, yeah, and by the way, I helped to burn New York City and I won't tell you any of my accomplices. So, you know, and then uh, and, and then he, he he kind of says noble words, I, you know, I. Um, I, I die, but we, you know, uh, but but I you know, but I know my cause is just. Uh, and then they hang him, and and some of the Germans are actually kind of impressed with him. Uh, but then Washington turns around and and writes to John Hancock, and he's like, you know, this newspaper item that mentions uh, Abraham Patton having been hanged. Um, it says he's got a wife and four children over in Baltimore. Let's get them some money, but let's kind of do it under the table, given the line of work that he was in. Uh, but clearly, this guy, you know, ha had done a lot of great service to the cause. So. Why is Washington sticking up for these people? Because he thinks they're falsely accused or maybe because, um, you know, they, they had done, uh, you know, what he wanted them to do. You know, he, he thought he clearly thought that the burning of New York City was a good idea. Uh, a couple of his generals had told him so as well. Washington clearly can't take responsibility directly for burning New York City. And he definitely when he writes to Congress and when he writes to the governor of Connecticut, he says, you don't know how it happened. Um, you know, and then his his officers get to work and and kind of say, all right, you know, uh, New England newspapers, if you're going to tell this story, don't focus on the fire and don't say that anyone did it on purpose. Instead, focus on the fact that the British executed a bunch of people. And in the meantime, they're committing all these other uh, atrocities like plundering American homes and things like that. So basically, a, a disinformation campaign is started by Washington's men to try and take everybody's uh, eyes away from the idea that Washington's men might have set this fire, something the Americans had been promising to do for months. Um, so they really didn't want people to put the obvious two and two together, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you're, you've got a, of course, a circumstantial uh, argument there, which may suggest or may implicate Washington. Um, and then you've got evidence on the ground from eyewitnesses. Yeah, I, eyewitnesses. So, I mean, many historic, many American historians don't like these eyewitnesses because of, most of them were British or loyalist. Uh, but, you know, but people, the people who were on the ground who saw this fire happen, they saw it break out in several places at once. They discovered combustible materials, both before, during, and after the fire. They catch people in the act who they say were, uh, were burning New York City. Uh, you know, they see all these things. They say that the, the firefighting equipment was deliberately tampered with. Uh, they see all these things that indicate to them, in addition to the fact that the Americans had been promising to do this all summer, uh, they see all these things as indicators that the Americans had deliberately tried to burn New York. Um, you know, this raises something that some readers might not be terribly familiar with, the idea that a historian doesn't just say, oh, here's this thing, I found it, I'm waving it around, and therefore I'm writing my book about this definite thing. It's often shades of maybe or maybe not that you're working with. You want to talk about that a little? I mean, my, a, a good example is my colleague Benjamin Hatt uh, at City College and the Graduate Center, you know, wrote a book about the Reichstag fire, right? Uh, you know, this is an important thing to know, you, you know, uh, whether it was deliberate or not, because, it, you know, it touches off such a, 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 events that we know are, are, are important to mid 20th century history. Uh, you know, so but but but, but it's, an, it's another example of historians having to deal with evidence that is imperfect or, or contradictory. Historians have often had these problems, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and and sometimes, yeah, we think there's a standard narrative, uh, but that's because historians have defaulted to the, the historians who came before them. Every once in a while, we have to go back and revisit the primary sources and say, well, all right, we know what the story is based on official accounts, uh, are there accounts that suggest that there was more to this story, that it was more complicated uh, than we might think? Or what do we do with the fact that there's imperfect evidence? If we want to reconstruct the lives of the indigenous, of enslaved people, of illiterate people, of poor women, you know, of ordinary rank and file soldiers who are not necessarily writing down their thoughts, how do we do that? How do we how do we reconstruct that? Do we use archaeology? Do we use material culture, you know, maybe powder horns that they carved? Uh, do we try and read against the grain 
right? Read sources that were written by more literate and elite people and try and triangulate and figure out what ordinary were people, people were thinking based on what the elite sources say, right? This is something that historians are challenging themselves to do over and over in order to recover the voices of people who don't speak to us in the sources. The only way that we can find out what the mentality is uh, of people who didn't write down their thoughts um, is to try and put together scraps and draw the truest conclusions we can. And knowing that in the next go round, in the next generation or the next year, somebody's going to come along with a counter argument or, and, and, and so it goes, you keep sort of triangulating, moving forward. Yeah, that, that's what history is, right? It, it, you know, it's not just a kind of boring timeline and chronicle of the events of the past. It's a vibrant conversation about what happened in the past, uh, where, yeah, we're constantly, not just because we sometimes discover new sources, but because we figure out new ways to interpret the sources, right? Uh, women's and gender historians come along in the 1970s and they say, hey, there's other ways to look at these major events where if you have gender in your mind, um, you can see things through the realm of femininity, masculinity, sexuality that completely changes your perspective on how some of these events or, or, or historical developments unfolded. Uh, you know, uh, uh, similar by uh, by providing uh, uh, perspectives from other uh, identity categories, or let's say applying an environmental history lens. Right? How does that change our understanding of? Uh, the Civil War, right? For instance, uh, if we look at it as an event that, uh, in addition to destroying towns, also destroyed forests, right? Uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden we we can create a richer picture of the past, one that might hold different lessons for us today than than a standard political diplomatic history, military history might do. And for most of American history, certainly the American Revolution, it was obligatory. I mean, the way the, the, the blinders that were on, that we all always have blinders on of some kind or another, but the blinders that were on were, you know, this is a valorous war. It's a good, and therefore, you know, the way you portray events on the, the back and forth of events uh, has a certain stateliness to it. And a lot of what, uh, of time that you spend in this book uh, is talking about how in the case of something like this, a fire in New York City in the middle of all this chaos, it's the fog of battle. It's chaos and confusion, and and uh, that's not a, as neat a story. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the war of the origins of the United States, right? Um, and the, and 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 I'd like to think that the United States does not really have a core ethnic identity the way, say, France might claim that it does, or something like that, right? Instead. We have we we believe in this idea of a, a kind of volitional allegiance to the ideas of America, and so a war that um, that represents our origins by definition can't be a bad war. It has to be something that we teach as something patriotic to the children. And so what it has become, in the words of the late uh, Jan Lewis of uh, of Rutgers Newark, um, it, 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 you know, it it became a bedtime story that we tell ourselves about the founders in their knee breeches and the heroic soldiers suffering in the snow of Valley Forge. And I don't want to deny the validity of those stories, but I also want to suggest that like, it's still a war and a war has a lot of ugliness. Uh, and also we get a richer understanding of that war and American independence, if we can also look at it from the perspective of loyalists, rank and file soldiers, uh, from the perspective of women, uh, African-Americans, Native Americans, right? There are so many rich, uh, and, and you know this, uh, you know, uh, there are so many uh, uh, rich perspectives that we can apply, uh, ger you know, German auxiliaries, British soldiers, uh, looking at, a, at it as a global war that also took place in India and the Caribbean and the English Channel, right? We get, uh, uh, or, or in the diplomatic halls of uh, of France and the Netherlands, right? There's There's so much rich stuff that we can say about uh, about the revolution, if we can if we can just get away from this standard narrative of the bedtime story that marches us from you know Bunker Hill to you know to to Philadelphia to Saratoga to Yorktown, et cetera. So in that sense, your book about the Great Fire is part of this whole throwing open the narrative to in all these you know looking at it from pers the perspective of uh, marginalized groups, women looking at it as a global war and so on. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's something that I could only do a little bit because after all, I'm, uh, I'm turning this into a snuff film, I guess. Um, uh, after all, all I can do is um, 
you know, it's tell, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a micro history, right? I'm talking about a, a specific, very bad day in American history and providing <laughs> as much contextual uh, I, I, information to it as I can. And in the process of doing that, yeah, you know, I'm going to try and bring in those stories if I think that those stories are going to uh, give us a more enlight enlightened perspective into what happened. Yeah. So what what the consequence of the fire? Did it in some way um, impede the British? Not very much. I mean, their their intention after they took Lower Manhattan was to take policy, uh, Hook, New Jersey. Uh, the fire delayed them by all of two days. Uh, but where it does uh, make life more miserable for the British is they end up having housing problems throughout the rest of their occupation of New York City. The fact that 20% of the housing stock has burned down uh, does make it more difficult for them to barrack their soldiers and provide shelter for loyalist refugees and and New York and New York City's own loyalists uh, who you know who who try and come back to town and uh, you know and, and try and make uh, New York City a a, a loyalist uh, stronghold uh, for the remainder of the war. So the uh, so the fire does make life miserable for the British over the medium term. But as far as its immediate effect on the British military, uh, uh, not that much, especially because the parts of the city that would have been most valuable to the British militarily are not uh, are not destroyed. And how did it affect uh, its effect on the city? Uh, how long did it take it to recover? How did it, it affect its development? The, the Common Council doesn't get around to redeveloping this area and uh, laying out Greenwich Street and things like that until the end of the 1780s at the earliest. For, for a long time, uh, that, that area is known as Canvas Town. I mean, actually, one of my regrets is I didn't I didn't take the trip. This was in part because of COVID, but I didn't take the trip to the municipal archives. And that's where you can, you know, where you would really find the the best information, I think, about Canvas Town after the war, right? It, it, this area is referred to as Canvas Town because it's basically a bunch of brick half structures that then they, they, they kind of pull uh, ship's sails over the, you know, the roofless parts of these brick, uh, these brick structures. Uh, and, and, and so it's sort of like a shanty town uh, amid these ruins that you find poor people in, uh, 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 enslaved people who had emancipated themselves and came to New York uh, for the offer of freedom from the British. Uh, you know, uh, so it's 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 undesirable, the worst sort of housing. But some people try and make their home there. Uh, but it's known as a kind of slum uh, for a few years, even after the war is over and the British have left. And what about that that uh, line, that narrative that um, Peter quoted from that, you know, well, this actually made things easier, cleared out a lot of, uh, you know, sort of rundown neighborhoods and, you know, gave developers free reign. Yeah, John, John Pinterd, who was one of the founders of the New York Historical Society, says this, and Henry Collins Brown, who was one of the founders of the Museum of the City of New York, says this, right? They're like, when we look back on like how New York grew with the grid plan of 1811 and all this other good stuff, maybe it's a good thing that like, you know, the the twisty parts of lower Manhattan had burned. And 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 one of them even says like, it's actually kind of a shame that like more of it didn't burn, um, <laughs> you know, and that, and that the beauty of New York, right, is that we we destroy and then we find more efficient uses for the for the space. I don't think that that was necessarily a universally held opinion, but there were definitely boosters of New York who who had that opinion, like, yeah, stuff burns, you know, we, we, we build something newer and better, right? That's the American way. And that's in particular the, the take on New York. Yeah. And I mean, maybe, you had, maybe if you were in the 19th century, you had to develop that attitude because, you know, American cities were burning, you know, burning so often. <laughs> right, um, right. Okay. So talk about this, uh, the investigation that the British do. Now, they, they, there are two of them that you talk about, right? Yeah, like, I, th I think they do too. One is really very not, not very well documented, but apparently in the immediate aftermath of the fire, the British hold some sort of inquest uh, and they, you know, they had rounded up a bunch of people after the fire. Unfortunately, some of them had changed clothes with one another. And so when witnesses come back and look at these prisoners, they're like, yeah, I'm not really sure I saw this person. And so they had to let a lot of them go, but they do t seem to have taken some military men and kept them prisoner after this, but otherwise they let them go. And then the Americans turn around and be like, what? You caught a bunch of suspects and let them go? That cl clearly means that like we, we didn't do it, right? Um, but, it, but, but I think that the British were really, at the time, the British were trying to get Americans to, uh, to re-swear allegiance to King George III. So I, they were not in a very prosecuting sort of mood. So they were like, well, as long as you're willing to declare allegiance to King George, like stick around, right? like we could use you, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so the British like kind of just let that go. 
And then as the British are evacuating in 1783, the last British commander in chief, Guy Carlton, he says, hold it, hold it. We're about to evacuate before everybody scatters to the four winds of Canada and England and everywhere else. Can we have, you know, can we interview a bunch of people and try and like nail down this story once and for all of whether anyone had deliberately burned New York? And it's not totally clear why Carlton does this, but I developed some ideas. And to me, there's like a kind of secondary mystery to this whole thing, not just who burned New York City, but why does Carlton investigate when it doesn't seem like it would matter to anyone anymore uh, as the British are leaving and the war is, uh, and the treaty has been signed and the war is completely wrapping up? Okay, so what's your notion about why exactly he does it? Well, so, uh, so Carlton has three men interview about 40 witnesses. And I think the reason that he did it is that Americans were running around during this period making life miserable for loyalists seizing their property, in some cases, beating them up and exiling them forever. Uh, you, you know, and, um, and in the treaty negotiations, the British tried to be like, hey, stop seizing loyalists' property and, and, and give them back the property that you've seized. And Benjamin Franklin is like, no way. We are not restoring any loyalists' property until the British, you know, uh, compensate us for all the towns that they destroyed, right? You mm -hmm. British you know, uh, went through the uh, the entire American countryside with fire and sword. We're not giving anything back to the loyalists. We we see the, the the land that we took from the loyalists as compensation for what the British destroyed. And I think Carlton wanted to look at that, given that he had been serving for a year, you know, amid these, you know, right next door to these ruins. I think he said, wait a minute, maybe I could balance the ledger here by proving definitively that the Americans burned a pretty mm -hmm. large city themselves too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the British soldiers didn't do it. He asks, you know, he asks witnesses, hey, did you have any notion that British soldiers themselves might've done this? And everybody's like, no, that wouldn't have made any sense. Um, but he tries to find, he tries to dig up what these stories were. Who burned New York? You know, had they tampered with the firefighting equipment? Had the Americans removed the bells from the churches on purpose so that no one could sound the alarm in the middle of the night? Um, you know, what what seems to indicate a pre uh, indicate a preconcerted plan? Was Trinity Church deliberately burned? W were there multiple ignition points that indicate a deliberate fire? Uh, this is what he wants to know, and I think he wants to do it to kind of get it on record, and maybe even convince a bunch of Americans that. The American cause had been unjust and that maybe they might want to, maybe Vermont might want to join Canada. Maybe America wanted to split into three confederacies and one of them might, you know, uh, might become, you know, a, a sort of British protectorate or something like that. I think Carlton was sort of fantasizing in that direction uh, in 1783. His superiors back in Parliament, you know, just wanted to kind of wash their hands and, you know, and be done with America. But I think Carlton on the ground, you know, seeing all these suffering loyalists who who kept coming into New York City, I think he, you know, he said, as a matter of justice, let's make it clear uh, that, that the Americans burned New York City in 1776. So he's kind of countering uh, or hoping to counter Franklin's argument. Yeah, yeah. But but nothing comes of it, right? Like the evacuate, like the news comes in, hey, the treaty is signed, finish up the evacuation and get out of here. The British pack up their things and go. And the inquest that Carlton sponsors, as far as I can tell, doesn't even enter into the British National Archives. It winds up in the private papers of the clerk who moves to Canada, and then the New Brunswick Historical Society uh, a, a historian donates these private papers to the New York Historical Society on Central Park West. Uh, you know, and so that's why it's in this privately held library and not in any official records. It's a it's a very fragmentary and weird source that does not come to any conclusions. All it is is a set of depositions, really. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's get to we're about to, I think, go to uh, people's questions. But let oh, me just ask you the I mean, you you uh, expl you answered it in one way or another. But why was the fire forgotten? The fire was forgotten because uh, Americans really had no interest in owning up to this fire. They had a really big interest in saying Washington was great and noble. All the deeds that the Americans did were were good. Uh, to the extent that any atrocities were committed during the war, those atrocities were committed by the British. Let us now tell a patriotic American story that either doesn't mention the fire or says, oh, what an unfortunate accident that was. And isn't it nice that New York City rebuilt? When New York City historians in the 19th century tell the story, they want New York City to be part of a patriotic American story, the way Boston or Philadelphia can say that they're part of the patriotic American st story. It obviously doesn't look great that, the, that New York City was occupied by the British and were essentially, you could say, collaborators with the British uh, for the entirety of the war. Uh, and so, you know, why double down on that by saying, hey, New York City was so uh, unpatriotic that the Americans actually tried to burn it? 
So, you know, so New York historians who wanted to bring New York City into the story, the great story of the United States, uh, biographers of Washington who loved the guy and stories of the American Revolution that want to make it look like a great and glorious cause, none of them have any interest in telling that story. And eventually even British historians get in on the act and say, yeah, Washington seems like a good chap, but, you know, we don't think he burned the place either. Um, you, you know, by the end of the 19th century, you can see British historians of the revolution saying that too, both yeah. Whig and Tory. It's it's yeah. really odd. So what, I mean, is there an overall um, thesis, an overall lesson about the, uh, the not not about regarding the the forgetting of it, because as you say, it didn't fit the bedtime story, um, but the fire, the, uh, of the fire itself. Yeah, this is in graduate seminars, this is what we call the so what question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we can learn, uh, I've mentioned a couple things, right? Telling a more diverse story, trying to disrupt the be the bedtime story, et cetera. I think one of the things that, um, that we can say is that wars, Ha create these zones of chaos and these unintended effects, uh, and that we need to think about those things rather than say that our claims for why we go to war are always going to, you know, be noble and and, and carried out in noble ways. You, you know, I hope that it, uh, um, you know, that it, that it leads us to kind of think twice uh, by reminding ourselves of what wars are like, even the ones that we think of as being the most noble. I mean, I think I have plenty of other uh, things that I say in the book, but that is another lesson that I, I guess yeah, I've yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like you know, what we've learned, what what the Vietnam War did to America. We, you're now sort of taking that sensibility and and going back to the beginnings. And, and the truth is, if I can be a historiography nerd for a second, I mean, there's a school of military history, what, what used to be called the new military history, and now is called like war and society history, that really grew out of the Vietnam era, right? Like, let's look at what war is like for ordinary soldiers. Let's look at the impact of war on ordinary civilians. Let's take a wider perspective on war beyond just logistics and operations. Uh, that if we're going to tell the story of wars, we need to tell the story of, um, you know, of the of the wider effects of wars, how they're remembered, uh, what kinds of military cultures different societies develop, uh, how they fight one another, do they differentiate between fighting one kind of enemy and another, um, all, th you know, getting into the mindset of how wars are fought, not just the kind of science of, uh, of military science. Yeah, I mean, over and over again, we're what you're what you're talking about is the approach to history that people take today as opposed to as recently as what 20 or 30 years ago yeah we're, we're, uh, 40 50 yeah yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, you know it's always been a mix right like operations history is still valuable and there are still practitioners who do it and do a wonderful job of it um but if you go to the you know the society of military history conference which was just held recently um you'll see a really interesting mix of uh, of people with a lot of different perspectives on on wars and the and the units that fight them Right, right. Okay, I think we should get to, there are a lot of questions it looks like here. Uh, Peter, are you coming on to uh, do those? I am, I'm here. Um, I have a weird glare going on, I apologize, hold on. I've been fighting my weird glares all evening. Yeah. Um, well, my apologies to the crowd. Um, so- um, It looks like uh, you're heaven sent, Peter, which honestly I wouldn't dispute. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, I'm um, sure that's how no one thinks of me, but uh, uh, okay. So yeah, we do have a lot of questions here. Let's let's try to uh, work through these. Um, and I'll remind the audience again: if you want to send in questions, you use the Q and A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, first off, it's a question about um, from Robert Wong, who asks: uh, Were there any isolated attempts to burn Philadelphia uh, during the British uh, evacuation in '78? Um, any correspondence between Washington and Congress about burning or not burning Philadelphia? And might the events in New York two years earlier have had some impact on that decision? Yeah, there, there were certainly fears that the British Army might burn the city on their way out. Uh, there were definitely rumors of the Americans burning the city as the British were coming in, or that the British might burn Philadelphia rather than try and occupy it. Um, every city that the British occupied there were rumors like this floating around. Whether those rumors represented serious plans uh, would require further investigation. This is something I looked into when I was working on my dissertation, but that was a long time ago, and I, uh, I, I'm afraid, and I didn't dig in as deeply as I did into the New York City fire. 
And so I'm afraid, you know, there, there's definitely stuff I could dig around and, and point people to. Uh, but, um, but yeah, there, you know, there were, there were definitely always fears that these wouldn't very combustible cities uh, would be deliberately targeted uh, by, um, you know, by the enemy uh, in order to deprive the other side of the advantages of, uh, uh, you know, of, of bivouacking in these cities. And then we have a bunch of questions I'm going to try to agglomerate um, just about some of the basic facts. Um, what day of the week, what uh, date, what time of day, um, how long did it last? Um, I'm, I called up Wikipedia in advance here. and I have uh, September 20th, 1776. Is that right? It's, it's, the, it's the night of September 20th, but it, the yeah. fire probably started after midnight, which makes it September yeah. 21st. And I believe it's a Saturday, give or take a day. I'm definitely right within a day of that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so I don't remember. But uh, there are there there are different accounts of when the fire started. Some people said as early as 10 a.m. Some people said as late as 3 a.m. But most of the I tried to look at ships logs as an interesting way of looking at it. And most of the British ships logs say that it happened between midnight and 1 a.m. Uh, but that might be not when the fire started, but when the fire got big enough that you could see it from aboard a ship. Um, I mean, the fire was so bright and there was so little light pollution back then that you could see the fire as far away from New Haven as New Haven, which is really remarkable to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a famous quote, right, that they looked as if all of the heavens were aflame, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a fire at night looks, you know, when you don't have electric light at night, looks just really, really dramatic. Uh, you know, one person says, that, you know, he's in Upper Manhattan. He says, you could have seen a pin on the ground by the light of, you know, by the light of this fire. Uh, and that is not something they were used to when all they had was the moon and stars. Um, there was another question, too, about, like, the frequency of fires at this time and, like, the sort of, uh, basically, they were um, expressing surprise that there weren't kind of more great fires like well, this. I was also there were, just not right? in New York. Um, you know, Charleston, yeah. South Carolina, Boston, Montreal had had major fires during the colonial period that burned up entire neighborhoods. Boston had had tons of fires. Um, colonial New York was unusually lucky in that it had had fires, but it hadn't had fire, but, but they had been able to bring those fires under control. They had been lucky enough that they didn't have fires that spread and burned up an entire neighborhood until this fire during the war in 1776. In the 19th century, New York City famously has a bunch of really serious fires, particularly 1835 and 1845, but those are not the only ones. Um, and in cities that were largely made of wood, you know, this was going to keep happening all throughout the, the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah, there's just hard limits on what you can do, no? I mean, yeah. Yeah, this, but colonial this... New York City was was pretty lucky. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like they had fire engines, but there's only so much water you can throw onto right. one of these fires, especially after it reaches the flashover point. Uh, and so at some point, right, like if you think about a hook and ladder company, right, that's because fire companies used to have hooks. What were those hooks used for? Pulling down houses so yeah. that you could create a fire break, giving a fire, you know, no fuel to consume so that it would just have to like stop and not keep going to the next city block. But any of you who have seen those dramatic videos of the Paradise Fire in California know that with a strong wind and dry conditions, flaming brands can carry a fire to a very great distance. And people said that about the New York City Fire, that, the, that a lot of the buildings had wooden shingles, that the wind picks up those shingles as they're aflame. And, uh, and that's what allows the fire to spread to such a great degree. And they're like cedar too, right? Which is especially, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this goes to, uh, well, actually, while we're talking about winds, I'm going to jump down here. Somebody had a, a rather sort of um, good question about this. John Allen writes, um, our predominant winds in the city, I'm assuming, are west by northwest, uh, correct? As farmers, most colonials would likely have known this. David Hackard Fisher, Fisher cites weather knowledge in Washington's Crossing, for example. I, I tried to do the same thing, and I used the ship logs for that purpose. And what I discovered is that the wind patterns around New York Harbor seem to be pretty weird. That while we might be able to say something about the kind of prevailing winds, I think that on that particular night, the winds were kind of blowing in all directions, and they shifted over the course of the night. And I found very little consistency among the ship's logs, which you'd think would have the best weather information since... Uh, you know, since naval officers tended to really care about that kind of thing. Um, yeah. There weren't any meteorological records from Manhattan Island itself. It's possible that I could have kept looking and found something from 
New Jersey, not too far away, but I, I don't think that that would have given me significant information. Uh, I do have eyewitness accounts that say like, yeah, the wind started coming from the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, going blowing towards the West, uh, uh, you know, and Northwest uh, over the course of the night. And that was what allowed the fire to spread. And then the fire stopped spreading once the wind shifted and started blowing the fire out to the, um, you know, out to the Hudson River rather than back east to burn the rest of the city. So that's the that's the best I can do is these kinds of reports from after the fire saying, here's how this um, how this went down. But it's it's not meteorological enough for me to be, to be able to kind of say with a definite amount, here's what the wind was doing. I mean, there's no question that the wind helped the fire to spread, but I don't think that necessarily disproves that the fire wasn't ignited with deliberate intent. So this gets to another question and I'll, and I'll, I'll kind of, again, combine a couple of questions here just to work through the pile. Um, uh, there's a couple of people who asked about the ignition points um, and I actually, called up this uh, uh, image we can use if you want. Um, and then the other question in combination is what type of accelerants were used? So I'll share screen to, to show this, um, what the um, ignition points, uh, and, and Ben, you'll tell me if this is this is accurate. I, I think this is, correct? These are all the different yeah, I, I may have uh, had slightly different points than um, than Bruce Twickler who uh, who made this map, but it's they're they're roughly similar because we we um, we used some of the same sources, which were those 1783 uh, depositions. But those are all the points where someone said they either caught someone actively trying to burn a building or they found a cache of combustible materials such as uh, gunpowder. But as far as the types of accelerants, uh, rosin, brimstone. Uh, 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 fireballs, uh, matches, which were not like little tiny matches from matchbooks, as we'd say nowadays, they were more like a foot long uh, uh, and, and dipped in, uh, in combustible materials, uh, uh, kindling, barrels of gunpowder, uh, tar barrels, uh, light balls, you, you know, all, all sorts of things, things that you would use for industrial or military purposes in the 18th century that were known to be uh, particularly flammable and known to have accelerant properties. Uh, then there's a question about how the fire was reported in papers at the time, and you touched on this a bit, but you, you said in the, in, the, in the book that everyone in New York was convinced that, that the Patriots had, had set this fire, right? And this was long rumored for months and months and months, right? Mm -hmm. and, there was, and, and you also said that there's a, they found stuff like a week ahead of time. They found a, a cache of combustibles. It was a big cache. You kind of go over that quickly in the book, or with a trail of gunpowder leading from it, which seems to <laughs> indicate, you know, not just something that was that happened to be stashed there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, sorry, but you, I mean, as far as the newspapers, that's like I have a whole chapter on on newspaper coverage, yeah. right? There's the loyalist version of the fire. Uh, and then you see the various American versions of the fire and, uh, and, and you can see both sides really trying to kind of work the press to tell very different stories about what had happened. Yeah, wildly exaggerating and, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we've already talked a little bit about, um, well, I'll ask this question just because just there's a bit of an accent to it that maybe is worth exploring. Um, question of whether or not it was a fair trial of the folks who were convicted. There's a several executions on the spot, right? Do we have a sense of whether, I can't remember if you sort of addressed that in the book. I mean, as far as the people that were executed on the spot, of course, they're not being given any kind of fair trial. Those are not, no executions by there, soldiers. But, um, but is, is there, is this like a sort of, is there, a, a, are, are British soldiers sort of, uh, it, is this sort of a mob action by, Sort of. I mean, again, under the laws of war, you could execute an incendiary if you caught them in the act. So, you, you know, like, uh, like, we're just going to like, so yeah, maybe it's a rising out of rage. Uh, but it was a, a, a rage that was justifiable. And, and none of those soldiers ever would have been court martialed for having done yeah. such a thing that, that yeah. just would not have happened. Um, there is a reference to trials immediately afterwards in the 1776, but they don't appear in British court martial records. They might have been regimental trials. Uh, you know, there definitely were not civilian courts in existence because uh, New York City remained under martial law until the end of the war. Um, so those trials may have just been, you know, courts of inquiry held by the the the, the judge, uh, the deputy judge advocate general. 
uh, really just kind of saying, hey, were you there? What can you tell us? And then try and, and then just kind of passing a sort of court martial style judgment and then either letting them go or if they were military, they could just say, well, let's just make them prisoners of war. Um, so as you know, as far as justice, that's that's all there is. And that's all there ever is going to be. I mean, you know, the United States, once they reestablish civilian courts or New York City or state, we're not going to hold trials on behalf of this. And the British, you know, would not have seen themselves as having any jurisdiction to do this once the war was over. Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as establishing justice, that was it. And so, yeah, I have uh, 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 circumstantial evidence, but you can convict on circle circumstantial evidence, A. And B, right, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, we don't have trials. We don't have, uh, you know, some sort of neat set of trial records that we can use to kind of determine, like, what really happened here. Instead, we, we, we have to make a historian's judgment. And historians are allowed to speculate to some degree yeah. Yeah. about, about uh, yeah. Well, and you and you know too that um, there were some records of trials that were with, that might have either been destroyed by Howe or ended up in the private papers he had that were burned in another fire decades later, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, ha I have you know <laughs> documented that that some important records are missing. I mentioned General Carlton; he burned his private papers. The private papers of both of the Howe brothers uh, were destroyed in an accidental fire in Westport, Ireland, in 1826. Uh, the records of who the British had, you know, had in prison in September of 1776 were lost at sea in 1780. So there are, you know, there are important records that have not existed for historians to examine that would have shed a lot of light on this. Um, but there's nothing we can do about that. Um, Rob Haberman, um, hello, Rob, um, uh, of the John Jay Papers, um, uh, writes, uh, could Carlton uh, might Carlton have been pursued uh, have pursued the investigation because of uh, British pressure from loyalists in New York City that were seeking compensation for property losses at the time? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean that that is you know I think he was feeling a kind of pressure from loyalists, but not really from the British. His bosses back in Britain, I don't think we're giving him the order to investigate this. I think Carlton is doing this on his own initiative, but he does seem to see the loyalists as kind of his constituency. He has a lot of sympathy for them. Uh, and I do think that he was sort of doing this on their behalf with the hope that maybe if there was some kind of documentation of it, that some of these loyalists might've been compensated on that basis. But actually both the British government and the US Congress and states seem to decide that if your house is burned during a war, that that is not a valid basis for compensation because governments decide if we did that, we would never, you know, we would never stop compensating people. Right. And so in the Loyalist Claims Commission, having your home burned during a fire is not sufficient justification by itself for getting compensation from, from the British government. I mean, the British do establish this kind of welfare system for Loyalists, and they do compensate a lot of Loyalists for their service, uh, but not for this all by itself. There are Loyalist claims which mention property destroyed during the fire and make it sort of a sob story. But by itself, having lost property during the fire by itself does not seem to have been a valid reason to claim compensation from the British government. Can I throw in a question? Um, I don't normally do this, but in the book, you, you I mean, it, we sort of forget how common this was as a sort of part of war, and it's still common, but, um, uh, but there's also that sort of weird line where there's these sort of informal laws of, 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 of uh, laws of war, right? It's mm -hmm. one of the things that's in Washington's mind about not burning the city, right? Um, how how did that, how did that sort of play out? You sort of touch on it in the book, but I wonder if you had more. I'm I'm curious about that. How much of a conversation is this among sort of the, I guess the interlocutors who'd be talking about such that laws? Yeah, I almost wrote a book on this, right? Like uh, like trying to document every single instance of a town, city, or, or you know, or, or Native American town that was burned during the American Revolution. And I really got very interested in what both sides thought. It was a great uh, academic article by the British historian Stephen Conway about how British officers and soldiers thought about burning cities. Officers were sort of split uh, between fire and sword men who thought that the best way to drive the Americans back to their allegiance would be to destroy them and stuff and make them feel the hard hand of war the way Sherman did to William Tecumseh Sherman did to Georgia and, and South Carolina in, in, in the 1860s. 
And then there were more conciliationists, right? British officers who were like, no, the best way to return the Americans to their allegiance is to, you know, to make nice, to strike alliances, to show, uh, show how benevolent the British government is, and then the Americans will wise up and return to the fold. And the fact that the British have kind of a split decision about this uh, means that they end up pursuing the worst of both policies, which is they destroy just enough stuff to really anger the Americans, but they don't do it enough to um, to drive the Americans into submission. And so uh, and so the, the, the way the British do things is they sort of they're kind of ham fisted about the propaganda side of the war. And they, you know, and, and so they lose the kind of public opinion side of this. The Americans, meanwhile, I think, are just disingenuous about this. They say we are noble. We are just we are doing this for the right reasons. We couldn't possibly, you know, uh, uh, burn anything. And so they just when they burn stuff, they just deny it or sweep it under the rug, um, uh, uh, you know, or they say, well, it doesn't matter because what we burned were Native Americans. I and mean, the Norfolk story is crazy. Yeah. So uh, so that's my conclusion about how both sides treat the issue of destroying stuff. But to really co uh, uh, be comprehensive about this, you'd also need to look at it in relation to other kinds of crimes against civilians, whether it's uh, sexual assault or, you know, and then also treatment of prisoners of war. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you can talk about in terms of the conduct of war and the behavior of officers and soldiers on both sides. Well, this segues into another question that Anne Haddad had about um, whether or not the immediate aftermath of the fire means that patriots are um, treated more harshly. Um, and I, I have, yeah, well, I'll let, me let you answer that question. Yeah, I, I think that the that the British kind of burned out their notion of vengeance on these um, on these guys that they uh, executed on the spot. The fact that they then let most of the other people go meant that they were like, yeah, all right, like you know, we, we're not going to prove anything against these other people. We'll just look unjust if we keep executing more people. So let's you know, we'll hang Nathan Hale because we caught him for espionage and he confessed. But otherwise, we've kind of slaked our thirst for vengeance. Uh, they keep, you know, if we, if, if we knew these guys were military officers, we'll hang on to them as, as POWs and keep some of them in really harsh, close confinement. Uh, but otherwise, you know, and, and they do seem to have kind of still grumbled about guys like Amos Fellows and Abraham Van Dyke, who they kept in, mil in their military prisons. But otherwise, you know, there's grumbling here and there, but for the most part, nobody's really listening. Um, and the and the British the British have other things to do. They have to go chasing after Washington and try and actually win the war. So dwelling on the fire was not really on most people's minds. I mean, you can see comments by loyalists here and there throughout the war saying, like, damn it, ever since the Americans burned that part of town. And you know, they still remain convinced that the Americans had done it, but there's no there's there's nowhere to go with that argument, at least as far as the British seem to be concerned. Um, Diane Tucker followed up with a similar question that was directly about the POWs, and this is where I thought you were going to go. I mean, the POWs are just they're they're considered rebels. So, it's does the fire have any bearing in the <laughs> harsh treatment that they get? Uh, that's hard to say. Uh, I mean, there's some great books. You know, I really recommend uh, my predecessor Edwin Burroughs, uh, who wrote the book Gotham. Right? He also wrote his last one. Uh, his second to last book was Forgotten Patriots, which is about uh, the American prisoners of war. And then my friend uh, Cole Jones at Purdue University uh, wrote a, a, a great a great book uh, called- um, Captives of Liberty. Yeah, yeah, Captives of Liberty about how the Americans treated their prisoners. And the truth is the Americans didn't treat their prisoners all that much better. Uh, and the truth is, this is, you know, it was about the atrocities on both sides, that as other sides commit uh, atrocities, uh, the other side thinks they have less and less reason to treat their POWs well, in an ideal world, all these people would have just been exchanged for one another and let out of prisons, but that doesn't happen in part because the British don't necessarily re recognize the Americans as legitimate belligerents and the Americans too, you know, uh, uh, you know, how their things that they want to grumble about against the British. And so it's really tragic because a lot of people die in terrible prison conditions, um, you know, long after they had fired a shot in anger um, or even thought about doing so. Uh, so, and it, but it is mixed in with these other things that are characterized as war crimes or atrocities. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, do you mind if I ask another question? Um, the, uh, when Russell was asking earlier about the, the pilot, the evidence that points to this, um, one thing I think you didn't mention, but you mentioned in the book, of course, is, is the missing, um, water pumps and bells in the city. The bells would have been to sort of 
uh, bring folks out. And of course, a lot of the cities evacuated at this point. That's part of the, the problem too. Um, people are evacuating before the invasion. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I caught or missed uh, in the book where uh, the sort of significance of taking that step is that that was part of the reason people thought this was deliberate, that that they were just, just taking away the things that they would have used to, to put out the fire, right? Yeah, it's one of those pieces of evidence that cuts both ways. Either, right, it was an evacuated city with a diminished civilian population, many of the firefighters had left, the bells had already been removed anyway, the firefighting equipment had just deteriorated because there hadn't been proper civilian authorities doing their civilian things for months, right? And that, um, it, you know, and so obviously the city was in a bad state of fire res readiness. The loyalists and British, however, turn this around and say, aha, right, the Americans were opportunistic about this on purpose and deliberately chose chose their moment and, by the way, kept destroying firefighting equipment during the fire. You know, there are some eyewitnesses that suggest that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that the Americans opportunistically took advantage of the lack of fire readiness in order to set a deliberate fire that they knew could not be properly fought. So, again, that's one of those things where it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to say again, congratulations on a fantastic Thank book. Um, thanks everyone here. for their great questions and uh, and Russell, it was, it was wonderful the way you uh, took me through all that. That's um, that's that's hard thinking to do that. It was uh, a lot of fun. It. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Russell, for great questions um, as always. Um, great to see you again, and thank you all for joining. Um, we've shared the discount code for uh, to purchase this book from Yale University Press. You can write the Gotham Center. Find us at GothamCenter.org. You want to get that that's the deepest card. discount i've seen so far so yeah take advantage everybody go out and buy it's good through june i think so they were very generous thank you to yale press for that um and the rest of you uh hope to see you at the next event and thank you again for joining bye everybody bye.